Hello and welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives, and it is Thursday, April 15th. We are looking at S13, a bill that came over from the Senate, an act relating to the implementation of the pupil waiting factors report. And I thought to start, uh, we would have our ledge council just go over the the language in the bill to sort of set the stage as to what's before us. So uh, welcome, Mr. DeMarais. Thank you. Good morning. Um, let me just share the screen here. Let me pull this up. Um, so, hmm. Where is it? I can't see that. Hmm. Maybe Jesse, do you think, could you send Jesse, it? Do you have it there? Because I'm having trouble getting off the internet. Thank you, Jesse. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, so for the record, uh, Jim Damery, let's console. We are uh, walking through S13, which deals with the implementation of the People Wing Factors Report. Um, we've been through this before, um, but just to highlight it once again, uh, findings, I won't go through the findings, but the findings, uh, first finding is about the background of the waiting study. Uh, <clears throat> the B, B finding is some of the outcomes from that study. And uh, just to note the quoted language here that says that um, the findings were stark. Um, the report stated that neither the factors considered by the current formula nor, nor the value of the weights reflect contemporary educational circumstances and costs and that the current values for the existing weights have weak ties, if any, with evidence describing the difference in costs of educating students with desperate needs or operating schools in different contexts. And it talks about what to do about this. Um, so I'm going to do this in detail, but basically uh, it's a kind of an ongoing effort here to correct the situation. So if you can scroll, scroll down, uh, Jess, uh, to, Section two. Okay, so we this creates the task force. It is a legislative task force, uh, which means that the majority of members are members of the General Assembly. Um, the main task is to recommend to the General Assembly an action plan and propose legislation to ensure that all public uh, school students have equitable access to educational opportunities taking into account the report. Uh, the membership is um, the chairs or designees of Senate Education, um, Senate, uh, Senate Finance, House Ways and Means, and House Education, and the Secretary of Education and Chair of State Board or designees, so six members. The powers and duties of the task force, again, uh, very concrete in terms of, of an action plan and proposed legislation uh, with specific tasks below. Um, I think there are six of them. The first is to recommend which weighting factors to modify or create and their associated weights and whether any weights should be eliminated in lieu of categorical aid. Uh, second, uh, to consider use of categorical, categorical aid uh, including whether that aid should be used instead of some or all of the weighting factors, and if weighting factors are used, whether small school grants, transportation aid, and other state grant funding, target, funding targeted for a specific purpose should be adjusted or terminated. Three, recommend how to ensure that school districts are using funding to meet education quality standards, and improve student outcomes and opportunities. Four, consider education uh, property tax rates and the paying, the taxing capacity of school districts and how the task force recommendations relate to the recommendations of the Vermont Tax Structure Commission report that came out in February. Five. I found this on the web for property tax rates being contested. Oh, sorry, I might. Uh, five, recommend how to transition 
to the new weights or categorical aid to promote equity and ease the financial impact on school districts during the transition, including the availability uh, and use of federal funding. Six, recommend how tuition rates for non-operating school districts and career technical centers should be adjusted to account for the costs of educating students as reflected in the recommended weights or uh, categorical aid. Uh, seven, consider school funding formulas in other states and alternative models to, for school funding. Um, uh, eight, consider the relationship between the recommended weights or aid and changes to special education funding under Act 173 and the impact of the weights or aid on the goals uh, and outcomes under Act 60 and Act 46. Uh, D, requires the task force to retain a consultant to assist it uh, with expertise and experience in providing advice on Vermont's education funding, funding and tax system and uh, be nationally recognized in the field of educational funding and tax systems. Um, the task force is required to collaborate uh, with uh, various uh, organizations, so the bees, um, so the usual group here. Um, and then uh, F is public meetings. Uh, the task force uh, is required to hold one or more meetings to share information and receive input from the public, um, which may be part of or separate from its regular meetings. Uh, the report is back to you uh, by January of next year. Um, and the meetings are standard language. If you scroll down a bit further, Jess, um, uh, this is standard. Uh, the task force uh, shall not meet more than 12 times. Uh, assistance comes from various places. So agency is providing um, administrative assistance, which is uh, organizing meetings and taking minutes. Technical assistance, including uh, retention of the contractor and overseeing seeing the work of the contractor and uh, that data analysis is with JFO. Uh, the contractor will provide assistance in uh, executing the task force forces, powers, and duties, and writing the report required. And this council will provide legal advice and uh, draft proposed legislation. Uh, conversation is standard. Um, and then three, section three, uh, just as an acknowledgement that the, um, when, when the report comes back next year, uh, there needs to be further action taken by the General Assembly to implement. Um, and uh, its intention is to pass legislation during the second year of the biennium to implement change uh, these changes. Uh, and that, I think, is almost it. Just scroll down. Oh, yeah. Sorry, the appropriation is uh, 10800 for the uh, per diem. Uh, from the general fund and uh, 150,000 from the general fund uh, for to the JFO uh, to retain the consultant. And the effective date is on passage. Quick question on, on number seven. It says a positive both of, vote of both the House and Senate and approval by the governor would require be required. So if the House voted 149 to one in favor of it and the governor didn't approve of it, would that mean it didn't get approved. I mean, it looks like it's just a strange, strange language that we, I think, we need to look at. Yeah, that was put there. Um, I believe just to show the intention that there are further steps to be taken to get this done. Um, but we can yeah. obviously change the language. Yeah, I would hate to think one forty nine to one, and the governor said no. Uh, that that would sounds like it would be a problem because there's no op no opportunity for a veto override. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, Secretary French, you've had an opportunity to take a look at this. Um, yeah, good morning, uh, Dan French, Secretary of Education. Uh, it's good to see you all. Um, as I mentioned, I testified previously on this, and uh, so I just thought I'd make some brief comments uh, really on section two, uh, which gets into the uh, scope of the task force. Um, as I, in my prior testimony, I supported the idea of 
um, standing up a task force because I think the waiting study as, as addressed in the findings uh, is pretty significant and it does need some consideration and evaluation on how to implement it. Um, my general comment would be on section two, however, is that the, the scope here is well beyond um, a real sort of focused analysis of how to implement the waiting study. And to a certain extent, it starts to appear to be a, a whole nother study of our finance system. So <clears throat> I would just encourage the committee to consider narrowing the scope of the task force to really focus in on uh, how to implement the waiting study. Um, in particular, I just I'll go through the list. Um, starting on page six of the items uh, that are in this sort of scope. The, um, the, the feature of categorical aid is uh, mentioned on several occasions through here. And it's not clear to me why that's being included necessarily. I think you know the issue of the weights uh, in relative to Act 60 is pretty clear. Uh, the goal is to equalize uh, the funding effort. Um, categorical aid to me is, is an important mechanism of a funding system, but it's sort of a recursive problem, if you will, uh, relative to the tax rate. So I assume categorical aid would be raised from tax rates. So if the tax rates themselves are unequal, how would that uh, further advance the idea of addressing the goals of Act 60? Um, I think number three uh, is a point I have raised previously about, um, and I think this gets to the, the point about uh, how do we ensure um, districts are spending money in a way that would uh, address the equity issues because the weights, as you know, don't really bring additional funding. They could create the potential for districts uh, to spend more if they have students that need more money uh, from a cost perspective to educate students. So the uh, I think we have a sort of a placeholder for that conversation. Again, I don't think it necessarily belongs in this scope of work. Um, that work is being addressed or will be addressed, I think, through a conversation around the role of the state board, the role of the agency, uh, and regulations and so forth. Um, I, again, I don't think that necessarily uh, belongs in this scope of work for this task force. Um, Number six, uh, this is not clear to me, tuition rates for non-operating school districts and career technical centers should be adjusted to account for the cost of students. So um, non-operating school districts don't have tuition rates. Uh, by definition, they have to be operating to have a tuition rate. Um, CTE center tuition rates, uh, that's more or less a formulaic process by which those tuition rates are determined. So this, this section to me doesn't make sense, honestly. Um, number seven, the consideration of other funding formulas. I think that is essentially a, a better part of what the weighting study includes is sort of that analysis and a look. So I'm not sure that's necessary again. Um, I think the issue number eight, uh, the connection with 173, I think the weighting study points to a policy decision that needs to be made in this area. But I think uh, that that is front and center uh, from the waiting study itself and would be uh, essentially included in part of that uh, work of implementation. But that's a that's more or less a simple or policy decision, not necessarily one about how to actually implement the weights. Um, I think that's that's really it. Uh, I don't really have much to say about um, the composition of the task force or so forth. I, I would uh, just on a sort of related matter though, I would um, just put on your radar at some point where we should have a conversation about um, different task force and committees that are assigned to the agency for administrative support. We have a very limited number of personnel that take minutes and posting and so forth. And uh, they're being stretched exceedingly thin uh, with every task force or commission that's created. So um, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I think this is a year of task forces, primarily because we're unable to do our work in a, a normal fashion. So we sure. want to extend that out. Um, questions so far? Representative Conlon. Uh, thanks. Um, one of your comments was on sort of the scope of work of the task force, and especially around, um, you know, how do we ensure that uh, communities that might benefit with extra taxing capacity use that to serve students um, in the right way they in the right way they should be, uh, and you, it, it sounds like you don't think that that has a place in whatever work this um, group comes out with. I guess I'm a little concerned that 
really the work of the task force is to create a piece of legislation that can go before the legislature uh, next year. And I think that there's a, a strong desire by some to make sure, you know, to, to ensure that, um, that that extra taxing capacity would go to what it should be used for. And I guess, how do we, how do we as legislators feel comfortable that that would happen if it's not within the scope of work of the task force? Yeah, I, I, I would say it's a it's a great point. Um, I would say, you know, we'll just take the waiting study off the table for a minute. You have that issue right now. I mean, so there is an equalization process that occurs right now. And to what extent does the General Assembly uh, become interested in ensuring districts are, you know, making those investments? That's a question now, irrespective of the waiting study. And uh, but the idea of the waiting study and the idea of Act 60 is that there should be equity, regardless, you know, equity of effort, regardless of what districts do and how they approach their needs, the effort needs to be equalized. And so I don't know to what extent it would be appropriate to put a precondition on, you know, the fairness to say basically, well, we, we would only make this fair if we had some assurance that you would spend the money in a way we'd find it consistent. Again, that, that issue exists now. So I. I would say it's an important policy consideration. I was pointing to, I think that conversation has a placeholder, uh, but what you have in front of you in terms of the waiting study, I think you're well aware is a pretty momentous finding that the equalization is not working properly and that that should be addressed uh, head on. It's complex a task and I'm fully appreciative of how complex it is, uh, but a year has gone by already and albeit the pandemic has delayed uh, some of our, our review of this, but there needs to be some urgency uh, to this. And I think it is a, it's essentially a technical problem, but it's also the political aspect of how you do this in a thoughtful manner. And I would suggest that what's been put forward here is sort of uh, adding sort of more work to uh, distract from, I would say distract perhaps is too strong a word, but to diffuse some of what should be a very focused political conversation on how to implement the, the waiting more thoughtfully. So you're, you're seeing that the focus here should be specifically on the implementation of waiting and um, looking at equity of opportunity is, a, is a, a separate question to be considered at a different time. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, essentially, you have the equity of opportunity. That, that's never going to go away. We have that in front of us right now with the current mm -hmm. waiting system. Um, I, I would just argue that this is um, a, a, a dramatic change in, the, in a what is currently a pretty tiny waiting system, and we are moving towards a much more dramatically different waiting system. And let's see, Representative Austin, do you have a question? I do. Um, Secretary French, um, I'm just wondering how you would uh, define equity or equitable, equitable for the purpose of this discussion. Yeah, my response to that it has been to uh, review our education quality standards. I think that is the regulatory expression of, of what uh, those sort of minimal quality uh, requirements are for a school district. Um, we have some statutory language around that, but then that becomes more expansive in regulation. And um, in my earlier testimony and, and testimony I've given on other sort of related topics, I think there is a need to expand uh, the regulatory definition of what is our baseline quality to include things like facilities maintenance and so forth. Um, and I've shared out in some of my other testimony uh, framework that Massachusetts uses on that. Uh, it's, you can see it's, it's much more expansive. It's beyond just sort of the curriculum uh, or instructional aspects of quality, but also includes sort of the basic inputs of any uh, school district system. So I think the regulatory approach there um, could be improved in Vermont. Uh, I don't think we necessarily need to reinvent the wheel in that regard. I think we'd find that if we did a review across the country, we'd find some of the basic same elements that uh, should be incorporated into our regulation. But there's definitely a need to improve our regulatory construct to ensure better quality across the state. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for our Secretary French before we move on to Tammy Colby? This is obviously an ongoing conversation. I'm sure we will be speaking with you again. Um, please stay with us as long as you can. I'll uh, listen into 11 and then I'll, I'll have to leave, unfortunately, but thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. I want to welcome back Tammy Colby, Professor Tammy Colby, who uh, 
did the waiting study, just a reminder in terms of the context of this, or perhaps uh, maybe I'll let you set the context um, of how we got here with the waiting study. Uh, you would probably sure. be a little more articulate about sure. presenting it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Representative Webb and the rest of the committee for the invitation to speak today. Um, for the record, I'm Tammy Colby. I'm an Associate Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of Vermont. And I was one of the co-authors of what is now affectionately known as the waiting study, along with my uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Bruce Baker at Rutgers University and also Rutland Navative, and um, uh, Dr. Jesse Levin and um, uh, Drew Atchison from the American Institutes of Research. Uh, so very much a team effort. Uh, what I thought I might do today as a starting point is to do a bit of a level set with what with respect to what the waiting, the charge was for the waiting study, talk real quickly about some of the key findings, because I think that helps us um, sort of move the conversation forward uh, with respect to how we might think about implementing the findings. So if that's okay, I'd like to start that way. Um, I did prepare a few slides to, to help anchor that conversation and I can share those if that's okay with everyone. Yes, that's great. You're co you have a co-host now, so go ahead. Thank you. Okay. I also shared these with the committee as a PDF. Um, I believe I can do this. So just to start, I wanna re just remind us what it was that the waiting study or sort of the charge was for the waiting study because it was actually quite narrow. And the, waiting, the charge for the waiting study was to evaluate the existing weights and whether or not they should be modified consider whether new cost factors and weights should be incorporated in the equalized pupil calculation, and whether or not the special education census grant should be adjusted for differences in the incidence and costs associated with students with disabilities across districts. So we have three primary questions that we were asked to address here. And with those questions comes this larger framework that undergirds sort of how we start to think about answering these questions. And that's with respect to this idea of um, cost factors and cost differentials. And just fundamentally, states, not just Vermont, but all states are responsible for ensuring equal educational opportunities for students. But we know that equal opportunity doesn't necessarily translate to equal educational resources. So students come to school with dissimilar learning needs and socioeconomic backgrounds that may require different types and levels of educational support for them to achieve common outcomes. And we also know that schools in different contexts may also require different levels of resources to provide equal opportunities. So scale or the prices they must pay for all resources. And all state education funding formula, not just Vermont, include adjustments for differences in educational costs across districts. Vermont's existing school funding policy largely relies on localities to make appropriate adjustments to their annual budgets for cost factors and then adjust for these differences in costs in its funding policy two ways. One through categorical grants that provide supplemental funding for specific programs and services. And we see that in our special education grants, our transportation grants, our existing small school grants, um, but also waiting, right? And that really is the focus of this report, but waiting a district's average daily membership for cost factors and then using district's weighted membership to equalize local per pupil spending for the purposes of calculating tax rates. So what that does is it essentially means that school districts should essentially bear the same cost for educating dissimilar students. Existing weights in the formula right now, again, as a reminder, we have a weight for economically disadvantaged students, English language learners, secondary students, and pre-kindergarten students. The pre-kindergarten weight or sort of consideration of pre-kindergarten students was not in our scope of work for this study. So our work was largely focused on slide flipped, I don't know what happened there, sorry, did, did. was largely focused on um, the, the other three weights. Um, just some quick history here, the economic, the weight for economically disadvantaged students predates the path, the magnitude of that weight predates the passage of Vermont Act 60 in 1997 and has not been adjusted since. The value of the weight um, for the English language learner also predates the passage of Act 60 and has not been adjusted since. Uh, the secondary student weight um, has been adjusted um, over time. Um, and in 2017, AOE report, 
evaluated this weight and found a ratio of 1.18 between element, um, secondary and elementary per pupil spending. So we can see that there has been little recalibration since with these weights since um, Act 60 was passed. So what were the key findings? And I'm, I'm happy to talk about methods, but I, I, I think that might be a bit of a distraction for Jay. So let's just focus on um, the key findings. And if you have questions about methods, we can, I can answer this in, in specifics. Our key findings that were through our analysis, we found that there were five cost factors that are related to differences in educational costs across Vermont school districts. And these, and by cost factors, I mean, these are costs that are outside of school district control, right? That account for differences in spend, that, that account for the differences in the amount that school districts need to spend in order to attain common outcomes for all students. And those five are percentage of students who are economically disadvantaged, the percentage of students who are English language learners, percentage of students who are enrolled in the middle and second grades, Indicators for geographically necessary small schools and population density. With respect to the weights, our finding from the study suggests that it's time to incorporate both new cost factors for population density and school size into Vermont's education funding formula. Um, and that the existing weights for the economically disadvantaged EL and ELL students do not appropriately adjust for the differences in cost of educating these students to standards, which is, as I, as I sort of alluded to in an earlier slide, is not entirely unsurprising since the weights have not been recalibrated since prior to 1997. And even before then, it's unclear that they were ever empirically based. They, they may be a political derivative. We also suggest two new cost factors for the equalization. Um, calculation that's for school size and population density and that these could replace the existing small school grant program um, in providing sort of this equalization um, exercise for operating costs and that refining the secondary school weight to include um, a differential weight for the middle and the secondary grades. This is the, these are the recommended weights. Um, one thing I, I know all of you have seen these before, but um, with S13 in the back of our heads, there, there are a couple things I just want to point out here. One of the things is that the weights were developed as a package. The empirical methods that were used, right, means that we, in our regression analysis, we were controlling for multiple factors, which means you can't pick and choose weights out of here and have the full equalization package work as it should. Right. And I saw that that was one of the sort of criteria that were provided in S13 for the task force to consider, for example, which rates to use and also perhaps tinkering with the value of the weights. It doesn't mean that we can't consider other simulations, right, that, that create different kinds of packages of weights, but that they have to operate as a package, right? We can't think about these as a menu of options. Oh, just a, a question there. Sure. So, so uh, we, we consider it as a package, but we could consider it in terms of percentages as a whole. So if we were looking at, if we were looking at, we're, we're going to be implementing something, but maybe we're doing something over time. Yes. And, and I'll talk about phase in in a moment, but if, if, if it was unclear to me in reading S13 whether or not the legislative intent was to give the task force the ability to say, well, we'll just incorporate a poverty weight and maybe one for grade ranges and that's it and we'll use the values out of the report. It doesn't, they don't work that way. Um, and so I just wanna caution against that um, in sort of your deliberations around S13. There were other key findings in our report. Um, in addition to all the quantitative analysis, we actually did a lot of interviews and a lot of work um, in the field. Um, many of the individuals who uh, participating in, this inter in those interviews are actually on the call today as stakeholders who may testify for you as well. Um, but I, I do, there were a couple key findings I wanted to sort of highlight out of that work that I think relate to this discussion around S13. And that was, you know, stakeholders were uniformly opposed to continuing the small school grant program in its current form. Um, there, were, there were lots of concerns about the nature of that program with respect to how schools are selected, the criteria, and also the sufficiency in funding, as well as the, the ongoing politicization of that grant program, and also the extent to which that grant program might run at odds right now with um, other policy goals for consolidation um, that are related to Act 46. The second 
consideration I want to offer out is, again, as you're thinking about S13 and implementing the weighting study report, is that stakeholders were also very mixed in their perspectives on the need for potential adjustments to the census grant calculation for differences in student poverty across school districts. And because that was, as you might remember, that was our third question we were asked, like, should, should we be thinking about some sort of poverty adjustment to the census block grant as it's being implemented? And, you know, the, the, the concerns range from, gosh, we really feel like this is going to disadvantage some districts to other districts saying, I don't think this is really a big deal. But really, really, the dominant narrative was it really was too soon to tell. Right? Like this grant hasn't been implemented. It's really hard to know where we need to make adjustments and starting to try to make adjustments before it's implemented. It, it muddies the waters and it, and it might be the case that we are better off implementing it for a year or so and then coming back and having a real careful consideration of where we might need to be making adjustments. It's not that adjustments necessarily are, we, we should take adjustments off the table. It's just it's really hard to know when you haven't even implemented the program yet. The third thing that I want to bring, I want to highlight is that um, came out in all of our stakeholder interviews was that there is a need for specific and targeted grant aid um, to support schools struggling to meet different and increased levels of need due to childhood trauma and mental health concerns. And that, again, that was highlighted through our conversations, but also through sort of investigating other kinds of um, artifacts in the field around school budgets and, and whatnot, where we can see that there's a real pressure in school district around how to provide targeted and specific need. I mean, targeting specific supports for students who have critical mental health needs. Um, and so I would just wanna highlight those three things as we, as we sort of proceed with our conversation around S13. I just want to clarify one thing in, in your number two on there, when you were talking about implementing for a while mm -hmm. and then making adjustments, was that specifically related to the census base? That funding? I'm specifically block. referring to the census base block grant for the special, special education grant. categorical program. That was our third question we were asked to consider, right? Like, and our, and our report does model and can include simulations for different options that you might use to adjust that grant. Um, I think there are options, very viable policy options. I, I think what we heard in our stakeholder interviews and is that uh, it's really hard to tell to, at, to in what ways and to what magnitude adjustments are needed before a program is actually implemented. Um, and so our recommendation in the report was not so much that adjustments aren't necessary, but that it's too soon to tell where and what kind of adjustments might be needed. Um, so it's not a, it's not a no, it's not necessarily a, a no, we shouldn't ever talk about adjustments. It's that without having implemented the program, it's very hard to start to sort of proactively start to think about how to tinker and fine tune that policy um, when we haven't even implemented it. Uh, West Representative Austin, do you have a question? I do. Um, in number two, um, once or when this is implemented, what are the um, what are the factors? I mean, how could we set it up? How could it be set up so we would be looking for factors to determine if adjustments needed to be made? What how, how what would be the mechanism to do that so we could make a fair and equitable yeah, yeah. Uh, decision at you know after a year? That's a really great question. Um, and then my understanding is that the, the Act 173 Implementation Task Force has been actually looking at that question. But clearly, with the, when any policy change, but certainly one for special education, we want to be carefully monitoring um, information around child count, um, looking for discrepancies in service delivery, right, major changes, and also talking to individuals in the field to understand um, to what extent the dollars are receiving are insufficient. But I also want, I also want to want to make this point. Um, I know today our focus isn't on one set Act one seventy three, but I, I do I do think this important is a important follow on point, Representative Austin, which was Act one seventy three. While it had fiscal components to it, its intent actually was more around programs and systems change with respect to how we situate and our supports and services with students with disabilities and align our systems of support. 
with um, our multi-tiered systems of support and other uh, right tiered interventions for students. And in that study that we did in 2017, what we found is that a lot of friction in the field between a reimbursement model and that being insufficiently flexible, right? Yeah, and because of that inflexibility, it was difficult for, for schools and districts to make the kind of systemic, pol systemic changes that other kinds of policies we have in the state have as primary goals to improve services and supports for not just students with disabilities, but struggling students across the board. So, you know, yes, we need to be monitoring this, but we actually need to be thinking about this in terms of programs, but not in not just money, right? It's the intersection between the two. And would you say that um, the, the census-based funding um, grant change could happen independently of uh, changing the weights? It should. Right. I mean, it's already on the books. And so I, I and I think I testified before this committee earlier this session that um, now is definitely the time to make sure that that goes through. S school districts need that flexibility in those dollars to develop and implement comprehensive systems of support for struggling students across the board. Uh, we've always needed that. And coming off the pandemic, we particularly need that. Right. School districts need the ability to develop flexible, comprehensive models for service delivery that not only meet their obligations to students with disabilities as articulated in their IEPs, but also struggling students across the board. And Act One, the, the, the programmatic intent of Act 173 was to provide that flexibility and encourage that type of flexibility and systems change within districts and schools to improve service delivery for struggling students. Thank you. Um, and so I wanna talk about implementing the study's findings. Um, and then I wanna take a couple of specific comments to S113 and then certainly have questions that we can open the floor more, more broadly for questions. I think there are a number of policy considerations for implementing the study's findings. You know, as you saw in the, in the questions we were asked, asked to answer, and I think we did a really good job of answering those questions, and frankly, so does the field. The, the, the report has been identified as, as a national model. Um, it was recently published in one of the top journals in the field um, and was refereed by a, a national panel of experts. And, you know, it's a good report. We have good, right? We have really solid work in there, but our scope was not, our, our scope of work didn't consider implementation. And that's just where we are. So there are a number of things that I think that are, I'm gonna call policy considerations or design considerations that are still on the table. And I think that could be the work of a task force. It also could be work of the legislature, but you know, the task force certainly allows for stakeholder input and, and sort of works broader input on these questions. So there are a couple big policy decisions or policy options that need to be discussed. One is, you know, one option with the weights is to bring, bring is to put in place the new set of weights for school district si for school size and, and population density. And the policy decision there would be to have those weights in lieu of the existing small schools grant program. That's a policy decision. Um, I'm happy to talk about why I think, um, my expert opinion, why I think it makes a lot of sense to adjust for differences in cost for size and density in weights versus a categorical grant program, if, if that's something we want to talk about. Um, but it is a policy decision. And right now, um, JFO's modeling, which they did, assumes that the small school grant program continues as is and doesn't include those weights. Our simulations do. It does not mean that what JFO has done is wrong. It just means that we have multiple, we have multiple simulations out there. And we need to make, right, part of the scope of this scope of the task force needs to be making that kind of policy decision. What is going to be the recommendation? Are we gonna continue on with the categorical program or are we gonna bring the weight? Are we gonna handle cost differences in, that are related to size and sparsity within our equalized pupil calculation? The second thing that I think needs to be considered with regard to implementation is, um, you know, when we did our, our simulations, we used the configuration of school districts um, that were in place in 2017 
Um, there have been changes. We all know there may be more changes. So there's going to be a need to update the simulations, which include sort of those tax capacity calculations for any changes that, are, that have occurred or may occur, right, with respect to school district consolidation or even fracturing some of, the, of, some of these consolidation efforts. Three, um, and Representative Webb, you already mentioned this around phase in. Right, and I think I think um, Secretary French has, has testified to this as well. You know, a hard start on this, going you know from where we are right now to the new set of weights. I mean, that's a pretty big shock to the system. And Representative Conlin has already mentioned today. You know, like these are pretty substantial changes in weights. Again, not unsurprising given the amount of time that has gone by without having a recalibration and the fact that the weights probably weren't empirically derived in the first place, but it's a hard start. And so one of the considerations for implementation is what would, what would a phase in look like, right? Like how would you phase these in? And whether or not for districts, for, for school districts that might see changes in tax obligations, um, uh, whether or not a hold harmless provision of some sort is, is included in that phase in. Right, so maybe thinking about how the weights themselves are calibrated, right, in terms of phase in, but also whether or not there's there's room for some hold harmless provisions. Um, and there may be opportunities right now that we didn't have a year ago with the federal dollars that are coming to the state to buffer some of these changes in, in the short run. Four, and this comes up in the report too, is you know there's a concern that, and it's already come up today too, that we, we adjust the tax rates, but with the assumption that for districts where the equalized pupil calculation goes up, that they will use that new tax capacity to spend more rather than right, take a tax cut. And one of the things that, that is a concern is, is that you know, a tax cut, rather than in making those additional investments, it sort of runs counter to the narrative here, right? And so one of the things that needs to be considered in implementation is whether or not there would be some sort of maintenance of effort with respect to tax rates. So if you received some additional tax capacity by virtue of um, you know, re recalibrating the weights, whether or not a district would then um, be compelled to maintain a certain level of spending or a certain level of taxation and not take a tax break, both in terms of property taxes, but also in terms of municipal taxes, right? Because these yeah. two things can be fungible. Not, not everybody in this committee is aware of the impact of uh, maintenance of effort and what maintenance of uh, financial support, what that means. Could you just explain? I wasn't referring to that in, this, in yeah. the sense of special education. I was okay. referring to that as a specific policy option the task force might consider with respect to this, saying that we, there could be a maintenance of effort provision as a part of implementation that says, if your tax rate right now is X and you are now able to spend more, right? By virtue, you get additional tax capacity. You, your option isn't to continue to, is, is to spend what you are now and take a tax cut. You understand what I'm saying? Because that's a risk. And so this is a policy decision, and I, I would suggest that a task force or the legislature, this is an issue that needs to be considered in the implementation of any uh, sort of recalibration. Uh, five, um, there's also need, uh, room here to reconsider or sort of talk about the excess spending threshold and, and whether or not that, how, whether or not there needs to be some flexibility in that cap in the short run, but also what that cap looks like in the long run with the recalibration, with the waiting recalibration. Um, uh, there's a, an opportunity here as well in implementing it to talk about the role of the yield in establishing minimum spending thresholds for the state, for districts. And finally, you know, there's going to be a need for updated simulations that reflect updated budgets and also this issue of federal aid, right? That's coming in and out. Um, and, at the moment. So those are the kinds of questions that I see really needing to be addressed in a thoughtful way around sort of the larger question of how you might implement the weighting study. It's more than just the weights. All of these things are related. And I, you know, here would be a punch list that, that I would suggest of really critical concerns that have to be part of that, part of that conversation. There are, there, are, there are also, in addition to those things, I would say there are two additional policy opportunities that come out, they're sort of flagged in our report. And that is whether or not, um, whether or not 
the state would like to take steps to put a categorical aid program in for student support and mental health. And again, this question of poverty adjustments for special education on the block grant. So if you think about this one slide, I almost think of this as a checklist of things that a task force or a working group or the legislature specifically needs to consider uh, in its deliberations around how or where or when or what to do with implementing the findings from the waiting study report. In addition to that, I just had you know four four quick um, reflections or considerations for Senate Bill 13, which I know is on your agenda and, and, and all of you are needing to make some decisions about. Um, the first one is with respect to the scope of the task force work. Um, as uh, Secretary French said, you know, he and I did talk earlier this week, I think we share the same, the, I, I'm careful to use the word concern, but um, I'll use it anyway, is that you know th this is a pretty broad scope. Um, of work. It also has a really short time frame um, and a pretty small group of people. And I, in it, I, I you know, I, I understand uh, Secretary French's concerns or sort of admonishments around like, are we opening up the, big, the whole formula? Or are we focused on implementation? I think those are worthy considerations. I also wonder about whether or not the scope of work is doable within that, pe that period of time and whether or not that the scope is so broad, it's going to be a mile wide and an inch deep, right? Whereas if you go back to that earlier slide that I just offered on these really specific things that we that like to, to make changes in the weights that have to be considered with some real careful consideration and thoughtfulness and depth, right? Like having a really broad scope might dilute those efforts. Um, so I, I just want to flag that flag that as a consideration as you're moving forward in your deliberations. The second thing I already alluded to is I, I noted in the in S S13 is there was some dis, some reference to sort of being able to pick and choose weights and you know the parsing of the weights for specific cost factors is not something that's supported in the analysis in the report. The weights operate as a package. Um, uh, there are options for how we might re might think about simulating different packages of weights. We can certainly talk about that, but as as configured now, that that's not an option. Um, and that was a, that was a decision that was made um, as a part of the stakeholder group when we were when we were doing the report. Third, I did note that in the task force scope, there are some there's some duplication of effort with the waiting study report. Again, thinking about that broad scope and trying, trying to be efficient with people's time. Uh, and same thing, duplication of effort with other resources in the field. The existing, the waiting study includes a, a, what I think is a pretty careful and thoughtful analysis of you know, what the national landscape looks like with school funding formulas. In addition, really in-depth vignettes for the Northeastern states and some other comparison states. I noted that that was on the task force agenda and it seems duplicative to me um, as written. The second thing is, is that um, there was a pretty careful evaluation of the role of existing categorical aid programs, including transportation, special education and small schools. And I noted in S13, there was some discussion about considering that. So if, there, if it's the um, legislature's intent to consider those programs, um, I think more clarification for the task force and like what it is that they should be considering that's different than what's been done already would be helpful. And then the last one I want to talk about briefly is, is there's a lot of language in S13. Um, we've already started talking about today about these comparisons between a weighting system and adjusting for costs with respect to categorical aid. Um, and I, I've, I've seen this in not just in S13 and it's something that's been bubbling up more generally. Uh, you know, to be clear, our study was not asked, or it was not, you know, was our existing study does not include a direct comparison between these policy options for adjusting for differences in costs um, between school districts using pupil weights in a set of categorical grant programs. So that certainly can be something that a task force is considered. But I, I do want to respond more generally to this, um, if I may, uh, since uh, it, it seems to be an important policy issue that's that's being deliberated. And say this, that, you know, categorical aid programs are one tool for adjusting for cost differences across school districts. And, you know, just like any tool, there are tools that are used for certain purposes 
and there are tools that are not as well equipped to use in certain purposes. And I think we have to think carefully about what the criteria are for when categorical aid programs are most effective. It is not that categorical aid programs cannot and should not be used to adjust for differences in cost. In fact, our existing school funding system uses them, right? So the real policy question here for you and others is, right, when, when are categorical aid programs most appropriate? And when are other kinds of mechanisms appropriate? In this case, weights. And I just, I wanna put some criteria out there for all of us to consider as we had this conversation. And that is, you know, what are we really trying to do, right? Like, what are we designing toward? And what are we designing toward? You know, if the policy question is one of equalizing costs generally across school districts, right? And recognizing that school, district, school districts and schools are gonna have differences in operating costs due to a constellation of factors, right? Then categorical aid is not necessarily a good fit in terms of a policy response because categorical aid programs are best used when they provide specific and targeted support for particular programs or students. We see that right now, right? In transportation aid, special education, right? But when we start to talk about a general aid, right, things that can't be parsed out neatly, right, for a student on a per student basis or on a pools per school basis, categorical aid programs are both less efficient and less effective tools for adjusting for differences in costs. Again, it doesn't mean you can't do it, right? It's, it's the adage of, you know, you have a screwdriver, you make the screwdriver work, right? But what you really needed was a wrench. And so, you know, we need to think about what we're trying to really design to here. And so when we think about categorical aid programs, we can think about them as being better fits for specific programs and student types, such as students with disabilities, potentially even ELL students, right? And a much less good fit for offsetting the cost of serving economically disadvantaged students, for example, where the programs and supports in schools are systemic, right, and diffuse. It's also tricky with categorical grant programs to truly equalize costs generally across school districts, right? Because what it requires is a myriad of categorical grant programs, right? You'd have to, you'd have, to have categorical grant programs for all these little different things if you really want to equalize for these general right for these general differences in operating costs and that really poses serious challenges for policy for two reasons one you got to have good criteria for figuring out like what should the grant programs be for like what you know what are you providing money for and two calibrating the amount of aid that goes right that for for those things and we can look at New York State as a good example of, of why this is really difficult to do well. You know, if you follow New York State, you know, they've been embroiled now for nearly 30 years in constitutional litigation around adequacy and funding. And the approach that they've long used is one of sort of lots of little categorical aid programs that go on top of some sort of base foundation amount. And they have gotten critiqued over and over and over again by the courts because it's really difficult to get the, get the categorical aid programs right because they're trying to provide categorical aid programs that are not specific and targeted enough and they don't have good enough information on what the actual dollar amount for those categorical aid programs needs to be. We can see evidence of this even in Vermont with the struggles we've had over the years around the small school grant program, right? Like who should get it? What should the criteria be? How much money is sufficient to offset costs, right? So I just, I wanna put that out there. The other thing we have to remember is that categorical aid programs are additive. And by additive, what that means is they're going on top of whatever else is being spent or other spending decisions. And they're also separate from right, the dollars come in separately. And so that creates equity challenges, a new set of equity, I don't want to say challenges, new set of equity considerations, right, for policymakers. And those equity considerations are really grounded in, you know, $500 going to school, this school district, that's a high spending district, $5 per student, $500 per student 
hypothetically, in a district that's already high spending means something very different than $500 per student in a district that's low spending, right? And in a state where we don't have a foundation program, and we already, we, we've got variation in spending and local control with spending decisions, this additive nature of categorical programs is really tricky to calibrate well if we're going to use categorical programs to as an equalizing or an equity mechanism. I'm seeing some questions and I want to make sure to get them yep. before I can just I make, Can I make one more point yes, and then take yes, the questions? Yes. Great. Um, the other thing we have to think about here is that categorical grants are going to place new, right? So if you want, if we, if we, if we, Take if we say we're gonna we're gonna use categorical grant programs instead of waiting. That's a high, that's a policy choice you might make. You also have to consider that it places new responsibilities on the state, and th those may be responsibilities that that the state is willing to take. But I think you have to be explicit in your considerations there, and that is in terms of administrative costs, which are sometimes substantial. And also the, the new responsibility to oversee and monitor the programs that you're funding, right? Like there's, a there's a shift here in responsibility with regard to sort of making decisions about those dollars because they've been pulled apart and there's a different accountability system. All that said, I don't want, I don't want sort of my soliloquy here as being taken as an anti I'm, I'm not, right? I just, you know, when I see this discussion sort of percolating and you see it in S13 explicitly, I think it's, I, I just want to put out that like these are really important design considerations, right? Like this is all a continuum. There are choices that you can make, but I think it's important to keep on the table like when, when are hammers most appropriate and when are screwdrivers most appropriate and what are we designing to and what are some of the trade-offs with all of that? So I'll just stop there. But I, I thought just, again, in the context of S13, it might be important to sort of provide a little context for that. I'll stop. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I do know, and I won't have you respond now, but, but title, title are certainly categorical. Yes, federal federal dollars are categorical. That is correct. I'm talking. Yeah, you know that the federal government operates categorical programs because they have no no authority or real way of providing general operating support. That's the only mechanism they can use. I want to go to Representative James, then Conlon, then Arison. Representative James. Thanks, Chair Webb, um, and thank you so much, um, Dr. Colby, for your testimony today. Professor Colby. Um, you can I call me Tammy. <laughs> I don't think we're supposed to. Um, okay. <laughs> not sure what the rules are. Um, I have two questions. I, I won't ask any further about categorical aid because I, I think you were very, very clear and compelling. Um, quick question is um, your study did not consider the pre K weight. No. Okay. It did not. It was not in the scope of work. Um, my understanding, and this is something Secretary French might be able to speak to more clearly, um, uh, was that there was a sense that there is so much flux in the pre-K sector right now that trying to develop a reliable and valid estimate of differential costs associated with pre-K at this time was probably not something that anybody could do. It does not mean that that weight shouldn't under shouldn't be inspected it just i think that where we are in this current policy context and some of the big shifts in the policy context that trying to get a clear fix on like what that cost differential actually should be would be really hard to do right now and so that was not included in our scope of work okay and then my second question is um i'm trying to understand a little bit better um so as, as funding for special ed um, transitions through Act 173, um, and say we, de we just decide that, that the census-based block grant system ha hasn't been implemented yet, we need to give it time to do that, so we're just going to let that happen separately. Um, on page 74 of, of the waiting study, um, I guess what I don't understand then is when you when you set out your your different models or your simulations, one column, you know, you, you say here are the new weights, 
And then yeah. it seemed to me, if I was understanding it correctly, that you know one column controls for student disabilities and one column doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand how the, inter the connection between that discussion and the Census Block Grants and Act 173. I hope that yeah. was clear. It's it's it is clear and it's unclear intentionally unclear because oh, that's <laughs> not, so, so you, that was no, not no 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 it's intentionally unclear clear in the report because it was a it was a design it was a it, it was a design request to say what would the weights look like if the, if we no longer operated a categorical grant program right for special ed that you just brought this all in and so essentially that's what that does okay as you know, as you know that. Our recommended weights don't look that way because discontinuing the categorical grant program for special ed has been a policy consideration that has come off the table. But in an early deliberations, there was some, there was an interest in modeling that. We I see. did. Okay. So that's why I mean it's intentionally unclear. Right? No, but it, okay. it was so something, it was something that needed to be in the report. You'll notice that in our executive summary, in our subsequent testimony that 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 went away because that just is a, that's a policy option that my understanding is is had come off the table okay i actually didn't notice that maybe i was looking at an old like version of the report or something but okay so that entire column yep. that that based that entire column was based on a, a policy premise mm -hmm. that we would skip the whole block grant thing and integrate students with disabilities as a weight and that's well, so yeah, as long as we're whether, that, then that right, whether or not we're going to embed special education, the cost of special education students in other weights or not. Okay, okay. And so our throughout the report, um, we model different policy simulations, right, that where there would be different policy decisions. That was one particular policy decision that we were asked to model and we did. Um, my understanding is that has come off the table, which is why it was not included in my slides. And so our recommendation for the strongest sort of models that um, for weight generation are the ones um, that I presented today. Great. Okay. Thank you I'm so sorry. much. So I'm sorry for the confusion. <laughs> no, I, t I was, I totally the great catch. Like I kind of get it now. Okay. The thank great you. Catch. Thanks. <laughs> Representative Conlon. Uh, thanks. And um, I guess, Madam Chair, I might ask you if you I've got lots and lots of questions that I could ask that are probably more appropriate for the task force if we create one. So I'm gonna to try to keep this focused on what's in front of us if, if that's what you prefer. Um, you, you know, so I, Tammy, I, I, go, go I, let it rip. Okay, so uh, uh, Tammy- I'll hang with you as much I, as I can, Representative Collins. Well, so uh, <laughs> just in, in terms of the proposal before us, S13, um, and your long experience with creating public policy around education, yeah. um, uh, this is a bit of a different task force than we've seen before. Mm -hmm. Strictly legislators, kind of small. I didn't know if you wanted to weigh in on that. I think the, the membership on the task force needs to reflect the scope of work. So if in fact the task force's focus is on how to implement the weighting study, then I think you have the right group of people, right? That these are very specific questions. If, in fact, there is legislative interest and intent in addressing this larger constellation of questions, which are really important questions around our school funding system in the state, around, you know, taxation policy, you know, things along those lines, I, I would suggest that there needs to be a much larger group involved. But, you know, um, that to me is not an eight month project. In fact, that feels to me like we should be all having an ongoing conversation and an ongoing group that's working on this in a synthetic way, right? And I don't, I don't, by saying, by saying that, by, by my comments on the scope of the task force, I'm not saying that these other kinds of issues and questions that are sort of embedded in S13 are unimportant. Let me be very clear about that. I think they're, they're incredibly important and valuable. I just think that they are sufficiently important and valuable that sort of doing a, a broad brush, eight month, quick and dirty kind of real, isn't gonna cut it. It isn't gonna cut it. And, and so I, my suggestion would be that, that we start to think about parallel tracks here, maybe short-term, long-term. Um, you know, in the absence of other major changes to our school funding system, you know, 
in the short run, we do have an equalized people calculation. We, we do, it's there. It is our primary mechanism in the formula for, for, for you know, taxpayer equity, as well as you know, hopefully equalizing educational opportunities for students. And to the extent that the weights are miscalibrated, the formula is not working as intended. Full stop, right? We also have these other questions over here around like, do we wanna continue running a school funding system the way we are now? Important questions, but we're not gonna answer those in eight months. And we certainly aren't gonna answer them with a small group of people in a back room, you know, starting trying to think this through. So I would respectfully suggest that there's a, that, that the way forward here is, if, if it's the legislature's intent to respond to the report, the recommendations, which are that the weights need to be recalibrated and the equalized people calculation updated in the near term to meet those obligate, meets the state's obligations under that formula, then the task force needs to be focused on those specific things that move that task forward. There also should be another group comprised of a broader range of stakeholders and experts, frankly, um, in school finance and that starts to really work on these larger questions that bring in you know, the recent report on taxation, that bring, they bring in all of these other big considerations and think about this much more holistically. I don't know, Peter, uh, Representative Collin, does that, yes. did that answer your question? Yeah, very nicely, yeah, thank you. It's an and in both. Representative Harrison. Thank you. Uh, I just want to go back to the slide with the list of the uh, new weighting or the proposed new weighting factors. So I make sure I understand it and you don't have to bring it up. The, the, the current weighting factor for uh, poverty is, is 0.25, which in the chart it said 0.25, but I think it really should be 1.25. And the new one would be 2.97. And so correct me if I'm wrong, in, in the equalized pupil count, currently 10 students that, that the family met the poverty level would be counted as 12 and a half students and the new count would put them to almost 30. And, and the reason I'm asking that is that that seems to be the, the weight that's gonna shift the needle farther than any of the others. So, so, so the answer is yes and no. Um, so let me start with the yes, and then let me then go to the no. So, so the yes is that that it's that the that the weight of 0.25 is the current weight, and and 2.97 would be the change. Uh, if you wanted to have 1.25, then the, the weight would be 3.97. They're they're calibrated differently. The the no answer is that it's not as simple as counting pupils the way that you just did in the equalized pupil calculation because some of the weights are additive and some of the weights are mul multiplicative. That's not, that's not anything we did. That's just how the equalized pupil calculation is done. And in the report, we tried to find a table that said like, this is how it works. And so what happens is that because these weights, some of the weights are additive and some of the weights are multiplicative and they all combine together, that it's not a direct translation saying it's 2.97 um, uh, multiple, the multiplier is 2.25 versus 2.97. Um, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way in the calculation. Um, so yes, there's a substantial change. Um, and I, and yes, that is one of the primary drivers of, if you're thinking about the equalized people calculation tax rates and tax capacity, you know, that's one of the primary drivers of sort of rearranging the deck chairs around the state. There's no doubt about that, um, but it, but the interpretation of the weights and sort of how how that works is subtly but importantly different by virtue of how the calculation is articulated in the statute. Thank you, Representative Williams. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, I would like to show my appreciation, Professor Colby, for your comments on categorical grants. I personally have, uh, I am uncomfortable with the uh, possibility that they are not uh, used equitably. Um, and uh, they scare me to think that they might be used in balancing because they might not get to where they really should be 
and secondly, I'm not sure if this is a comment or a question, or I just need to come out and say it, but um, as a representative of a very rural area that has been under <laughs> financed in the, uh, in this uh, process, I'm getting a lot of uh, constituents saying, please let's stop doing these studies and the task force and, and let's move forward. It's time to enact. Um, and as I sit here today, I'm thinking that probably can't happen because of it's just too much to this process to just move forward that quickly. Do you agree? And I, I, I'm trying to figure out how I uh, communicate with my constituents about, I understand the urgency. We, we've been shortchanged for a long time, but, and I don't know how to fill in the but. Yeah, that's a really tough question. And, and I appreciate the spot you're in. Um, uh, I know there are strong feelings around the state on the part of lots of people on, and and in different directions at times, right? And you know, this when we make substantial policy changes like this, particularly ones that are financial, uh, it, it certainly it certainly raises concerns and stress in lots of places. So I, I, I do want to acknowledge, like this is not an easy shift, um, and I think we're we're seeing some of the products of that in our conversations and debates around the issue. I think the but is this: is that you know, I would hope that the waiting study that we did um, provides the empirical evidence and, re and sort of technical details that um, policymakers need to, to do something. It does not mean that there aren't still some things to be done, right? And I tried to give a punch list of what those are in that slide. And I think the real question for policymakers, and this is, this is more political than it is anything, which is, is, it, is the task at hand right now, one of opening up the conversation to restructuring the entire school funding system, or is the task at hand at this present moment, calibrating the weights, and ensuring that the state is meeting its obligations under the existing funding formula, while also keeping its eye on the ball with respect to these larger systemic changes that may be necessary. That's a political calculus. Um, you know, I work really hard to stay objective. And so I, I'm not gonna weigh in on which one, wh what the options are here, right? Like where you might go politically on that. But it seems to me that that's kind of the fork in the road, right? And the other thing I've, I would say, and I, I said this in ways and means, is that the legislature has done a really good job over the past number of years. You have really good studies. You know, um, the, I'd say the Act 173 study is good. I mean, it won a national award. This is an excellent study. The PICA study is, is excellent. We have the new tax study. Like, you have good information. In fact, you have better information than many states have. And you have good partners, right? I'd like to think the University of Vermont is a good partner. I mean, you have good partners in the state who are, are thought partners with the legislature on this. I don't know that this is an issue. I don't know how much more studying needs to be done. And so I think the real fork in the road here is how, how to proceed with policymaking, right? Like, you know, is, is, is the issue of the weights, for example, gonna be taken on in the larger context of a conversation around, you know, bigger issues in school funding in the state? If it is, then that's a longer term conversation, right? And in the meantime, the weights are not doing their job. And, you know, there are risks, there are risks with that in the state. Or is, this, or is this an and and both, right? Which is there, there needs to be a recalibration of the weights under the existing formula while also keeping sort of this our eye on the ball for these larger conversation that is important and necessary. So I don't know if that's the but you were looking for, but I, you know, I think that's the best way I can answer that question and not get, not wading into the political weeds, which I'm trying not to do. I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and, and one more thing, the, um, 
study, the UVM study that you put together that has gone national. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Are you getting a lot of uh, international feedback uh, in supporting that or? Well, we certainly have gotten, I wouldn't say feedback, we've gotten a lot of um, interest in it. Um, as I said, the study itself was recently published in one of the top study findings and methods were published in one of the top journals in the field, not, not, a, not a school funding journal, actually, which is more narrow, but actually one of the top education policy journals in the field, which is, I would consider an even broader audience, um, which is hard to do. It's hard to publish this work because it's, it's, it's difficult to do well. And so, you know, that means that it is reaching a much broader audience. We, um, uh, as a follow-on to this work, the state of New Hampshire contracted with the same group, and we just finished a design process for New Hampshire using the same methods and approaches, and they are very pleased with that. Um, in fact, Secretary French and um, a representative from New Hampshire just presented with us at a national conference on the experiences and sort of what was learned in the processes around these kinds of studies. So, you know, the good news is, you know, Good news is that Vermont is really at the at the forefront of thinking about these issues, as it has been for many many years, right? Um, and so that's a good thing. Thank you for your work, Representative, oh, and welcome, Representative Beck, who's visiting us from the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, appreciate having you your presence here. This has been an issue you've been following for some time. Thank you, Chair Webb. I'll just throw my my nickel into the conversation here. Um, Usually a quarter <laughs> representative back. <laughs> well, it's, it's the bottle bill day, so I'm gonna throw in a nickel. Okay. <laughs> so um, I appreciate the comments from everybody and, and uh, from Professor Colby about the fork in the road. And so let me just throw my nickel in here. Um, you know, the root cause of all of the changes in Governance Act 46, all the studies, Act 173, the pupil waiting study, the adequacy study, all of these, they come from a dissatisfaction with Vermonters in their how much it costs them in their property tax rates to pay for education, and they don't understand how our highest in the nation per pupil spending translates to the education they're receiving on the ground. And those two causal factors are what has caused all of this work to be completed up until this point. There are some out there, um, and a lot of them are our colleagues, that believe that if we just change the pupil waiting here and there, or we just change the excess spending threshold a little bit, that it will solve those problems. The truth is, they will not. They will not address the causal factors for all of this work. The causal factors for all of this work is that districts are too loosely connected between their spending decisions and their tax rates. That's what causes the inequity. That's what causes the, um, the, the huge differences between what districts spend. It has, you have a big disconnection and that is why the House has made attempts to close that connection, most notably with House Bill 1911 that passed in 2018. And so I guess what I'm trying to say here is, is that uh, the, the fork that needs to be gone down is the one where there is a uh, restructuring of the education fund to address those causal factors so that when we actually do change the weighting, which I think we will do, and we actually do change the excess spending threshold, and I hope we eliminate it all together, that they will actually have the effect that we want them to have, which is districts feeling like they're more in control uh, with a tax rate that more closely re reflects their the spending decision, high quality education for all kids, and equi equity across a whole myriad of different, um, um, different issues, not just pupil waiting. And so I think that the group, the task force, I think is the right group. I think we're at the point here where decisions have to be made. Uh, hard decisions will have to be made. 
And, um, but I think if we just think we're going to solve a problem by changing pupil weighting, then um, we're not really going to solve a problem. We're just going to uh, swirl the money around and we'll find ourselves right back here five, 10 years from now. So that's my nickel. Representative Beck, um, I'm unsure whether there was a question to which you wanted me to respond. No, no question, just a comment. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, interesting. I'll let your comment stand. Yeah. Representative uh, Austin. Yes, thank you. Um, could you help me understand a couple of things? One is the current weighting, uh, the current weighting percentage for poverty weights, which I believe is 0.25. Yes, mm -hmm. and then the, um, the your studies finding, uh, if implemented, would be at 2.97. Is that correct? How did you arrive at that? And how do you uh, see that if implemented, that money, that funding would go directly to students of, you know, in a lower, you know, to address poverty? Yeah. So um, I'm happy to talk about methods and let me do it in just a real high level way. And um, Representative Austin, if you'd like to have a more specific conversation or if other members were, I'm happy to, to to have a very specific and detailed conversation around methods, but let me step back and I can just sort of talk in big picture terms. Um, so, right, the weights were developed using something called cost function modeling. And what the strength of cost function modeling is it actually ties spending, let um, me back up, it ties the estimation of differences in costs with student outcomes. That's a really different approach than um, it has been used in the past. And it, it, as I said, it's state of the field in, special, in, in school funding research. And what it does is it says, what are the additional dollars necessary to spend to ensure that students with certain characteristics, in this case, an economically disadvantaged student, achieves at the same level as his or her peers who are not economically disadvantaged, right? So that's the delta, if we think about the difference, right? And so we're, we're, we're and we bet on existing spending patterns by looking at districts, right? Large numbers of districts and spending. In this study, we use Vermont data for the primary estimation, but because um, I think in Vermont, we always wonder whether or not we're idiosyncratic for lots of reasons. We also did the same estimations using data for schools and districts in the Northeast and schools and districts nationally to triangulate. And the reality is the, the, the results triangulate, right? And so we, so we estimated that cost differential for each of those cost factors that we identified. And then we, we used a process to estimate the weights based on those cost differentials. Um, Dr. Bruce Baker made, made an excellent presentation on exactly how that how that um, how that translation works statistically. Um, he made that presentation to Senate Ed. I believe it's available. Um, I'm I'm happy to have him come in and talk to you about this and sort of the statistical processes around that. But you can think of that as a multi-step process. Is these right? We use those kinds of data. W the, um, the period of time that was considered for this study was 11 years from 2009 to 2018, right? So um, I, I don't know if that's a pretty high level answer, Representative Austin, is, is that sufficient for right now? I, I, yes. I'm happy to bring in more, I'm happy to bring in more detail and I'm also happy to, happy to, to have, um, to connect um, the committee with Dr. Baker if you'd like to have the really specifics on the statistics for how that process works. That's how you arrived at it, but how, if it was implemented, how do we know that uh, children who are so, so socioeconomically disadvantaged will get those funds to lift them up in order to equalize their uh, access to opportunities? That's right. So that's one of the limitations in our existing formula, right? That the existing formula equalizes costs, but the assumption is, is that districts are making good choices about how to spend those dollars. So 
the fundamental assumption in our existing school funding system is that the district that the budgets that districts are passing are adequate to meet student needs, all student needs, and that they're investing those dollars in the most efficient and effective way possible. That that is the underlying assumption with how the system works as is. The weights, the weights calibrate, right? The weights equalize costs across district based on the budgets that are passed by school districts. So there is, and to represent the Bex point, there is in the current formula, no explicit connection between the dollars, right? Between the weights and how districts might choose to spend those dollars. There are other mechanisms, policy mechanisms in our system that are intended to do that. Right, and that, for example, the education quality standards that Secretary French referred to earlier today, right? But there is no explicit connection between the weights and districts spend, how districts invest those dollars. The other thing to remember about our weights is unlike a foundation formula, which is you know, the formula that is operating in most states nationwide, our weights don't provide additional dollars to districts. Our weights, all they're doing is equalizing spending decisions by districts that have already been made. So we're not driving additional dollars out. Great. Thank I'm going to um, take us to we'll have 15 more minutes. Um, I think we'll be able to do this. I want to uh, give Representative Hooper an opportunity. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Professor, for being here. Your, your testimony is always very succinct and knowledgeable. Um, if, if Beck is going to throw in a nickel, I'm going to try and throw in a whole dime, being that it is indeed bottle bill day. Professor, currently, our current system, um, what is our metric for measuring equity? That's a really good question. Um, and I think we have to think about there's different kinds of equity. Well, first of all, let's back up. You know, equity is, equity is all about distribution, right? Like, and equity is normative, it's fair. Like, so fair distribution of what, right? I mean, that's what we have to start to think about when we say equity. So equity isn't one thing. It's, distri it's what, right? It's something that we're distributing that we're interested in or we think are important. And so our current system right now certainly considers, explicitly considers taxpayer equity. That was a big consideration, right, in Act 60. So if we, if your question is, is what does our existing funding system consider? It considers taxpayer equity. And by extension, it is also considering equal educational opportunities, which is, if you think about it, that's distribution of opportunities to learn, right? So those are implicit, those two things, right, are implicit in terms of equity calculations in our existing system. What do we actually measure? That's a little trickier, right? Like we, we know we can start to look at spending, right? As a proxy for some of these things. And we know in the state, right? We've got some pretty big spending differentials. We can look at tax rates, right? We also have some pretty big differences in tax rates and tax capacity, right? The ability to spend some differences there. What else can we look at? We can think about, right? Because those are kind of input based. But we also know process matters, right? Like it's not the dollars that matter. It's what we spend the dollars on and how we invest them. And we also know that we have some pretty big differences across school districts in the state too, particularly with regard to teacher qualifications, teaching, right? It's other kinds of instructional resources, facilities. Mm -hmm. And so this question of equity, it, it's a tricky one, right? Because it's, it, we, have to, we have to agree on what we're distributing and, what, and then we have to think about what's fair. But if you want to take the narrow definition of equity under, under Act 60, right? Like our current school funding statutes, it, you know, the two principal things that are considered are outcomes, right? Opportunities to learn, which is also kind of processed, but you know, that, but, and taxpayer equity and fiscal equity in terms of distribution of tax burden and contributions across the state to the um, statewide pool of revenues for school for that fund school budgets. Represent, I mean, I'm not trying to obfuscate. It's just not no, an I, easy. I, it's just not. A, it's not one of those easy, straightforward questions. Absolutely. We'll say I'll say one first. Not a ten, not a twelve oh five. But professor, it's fairly safe to suggest that the current system does not focus centrally on the equity of educational opportunity for students. The current. 
funding system is focused on taxpayer equity, certainly, right. but by by indirectly, it is certainly focused on, right? The whole the whole point of the weights, right, is yeah. to equalize costs, and and by equalizing, it's intended to incent districts, right, and provide the capacity for districts to spend what it is they need to spend on kids to provide equal educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that the weights are miscalibrated, it means that school districts that might need and want to spend more because that's what they need to do to provide equal educational opportunities face a really tough choice. Tax, right? Taxing themselves at a, at, a, at a rate that's high or not spending enough. And we can see evidence of that. Like we see that we see that tension around the state, right? Like we see districts that are really struggling and taxing at really high rates. As a community, they've said we're we're going to continue to do this. We also see districts that say, you know communities that say we're not willing to tax at that high of a rate, and so we don't spend enough. And so it's that connection right there that creates the unequal opportunity, right, for students across districts. So acknowledging that. Today's four weights are too few and inadequate. Um, we are basically facing an opportunity, the fork in the road. The question is, do we go, do we embrace the data in your study and advance with along that track or do we depart from that, correct? That's basically- I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it, in, I wouldn't, put these as polar opposites, if I might suggest, mm -hmm. respectfully suggest Representative Cooper, what I would say is, is I think you have a timing issue here, right? And that is the weights are miscalibrated. I think, I mean, the, the evidence is pretty clear on that, right? The weights are miscalibrated, period, full stop. And so the question is, is what are the effects of miscalibrated weights right what? now? Well, yeah, right, and the effects of the miscalibrated rates are that school districts, that where that would benefit from the change in weights face a really difficult decision, which is taxing themselves at a much higher rate than they have to, should have to, to pay for, for to provide an adequate education for their students, or not taxing themselves at that rate and essentially not spending at the level that they should to provide an adequate education for their students. Mm -hmm. That's that's the condition right now. And the question, the policy question is, is do we address that immediate concern now or mm -hmm. do we not now and, and fold it into a larger process that might take multiple years to do? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a really tough, I mean, that's a, that, and that's yeah. a, there's political calculus there. Uh, I, I'm not gonna weigh into the political calculus, but I mean, that's as stark a terms as I can put, it, right? Like that's the decision. Yeah. Like you're gonna do it now or you're gonna, or you're gonna kick the can down the road. But if you kick the can down the road, these conditions are gonna persist. Madam so, Chair, may, may I ask two or three more questions? Or, or um, I, I, I'm seeing other people and I wanna just hold for, for one second. I just wanna throw in one, one for my, myself here. Um, a, a question here, as we're talking about equity and spending, we have districts that are spending twice what other districts are spending. Mm -hmm. So for simplicity's sake, we have one district that is fine is spending or, or they're spending 10,000 per student and another one spending 20,000 per mm -hmm. student. Do we have any information about the um, process, how those relate to, for example, poverty? Um, what is motivating a district? What motivated district A that was 10,000 versus the one that was 20,000 to, to make those decisions? Is it, what, what drives that? Are we high poverty, low poverty? High spending, low spending. If we put it into a quadrant, mm -hmm. do we have do we have a sense of, of anything that motivates that? Is is poverty a, a driving force? Poverty should be a driving force, right? So if we we know that it costs more to educate economically disadvantaged students, we know, right? The research the research is crystal clear, crystal clear that in order for students coming from economically disadvantaged backgrounds that the, to achieve at the same level as their non-economically disadvantaged peers, that school districts on average need to invest more resources. But do we know, do we know that that low spending district is also a high poverty 
we certainly can look at that and there's information in our report that looks at that, but okay. yeah, it, right. And so in Vermont right now, what we would hope to see is that after we adjust for cost of living and cost of inputs, right, that high spending districts would be highly correlated with concentrations of student need, right? Higher con and that low spending districts would be the opposite, right? We don't see that. In fact, in some cases, we see the opposite. Some of our highest spending districts are the districts that have proportionally smaller shares of students in need. Right. Right. Um, I want to go to Representative Brady and then I'll go back to you, Representative Hooper, okay? Thank okay. <laughs> Thank you, Representative this, Brady. This might be more a question for, for Mark. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, if I'm even thinking this through straight, but if we say we implement the weights, you know, we start to correct some of this in districts who um, are going to see a big tax increase or, or loss of equalized pupil, I should say, districts that are going to lose a lot of equalized pupils. If they decide, if they say, we are going to just spend that much more to keep our education programming or quality where it is, or even increase it, how does that then, because we still have a state ed, statewide ed fund, so if those districts are then spending even more, what does that do to the whole picture? It's and a great question. And correlation to the districts that we were trying to help through waiting as there's sort of a, yeah. This is, it's a great question and a terrific insight. And this is part of the reason on that list of things I, I said that the implementation the committee needs to consider is the excess spending threshold, right? So when Act 60 was put in, right, there was there was a governor at the top that it, that was intended to keep districts from continuing trying to lift off, right, and provide provide more and less, both because of equity concerns, but but also also because under a statewide property tax, everybody pays, right? So when this district decides over here they wanna put an indoor track in, everybody pays, everybody pays. And so that's why this, that's why these conversations, we, we have to think about that at the top and the bottom. So that, that, that's one response. So you're correct that that's part of all of this. And so that's why in that conversation around implementing any changes to the weights, we also have to talk about the excess spending threshold. We also need to talk about the yield and the extent to which we set the yield at a level that was established a minimum or a floor for spending, right? We can do this, right? Like, right? like the goal should be from an equity standpoint and also ensuring substantially equal educational opportunities for students across districts in the state is to compress spending, right? There will be variation, but the variation should be really based on differences in need not necessarily driven by differences in preferences. Because what you're talking, what you're getting at is the difference between need and preference. So in a district that might quote unquote be a high spending district now, and I'm being careful, I don't wanna say overspending, I'm just saying high spending district. And the equalized pupil in, and through the weights that district, um, re, the number of equalized pupils comes down. Right, so their tax, they will have to in their taxes, pay more to spend the same. That's a decision. That's a decision. If the weights are calibrated appropriately, then that decision should not be a hard one necessarily, right? Because if the weights are calibrated appropriately, then what we're doing is we're equalizing costs. And so if the hard decision is, do we wanna continue spending at this level and our tax rates are going up, the conversation should be, are we spending what we should be spending, right? But we also need guardrails at the top and the bottom on that, both in terms of the excess spending threshold and the yield, so that we're being thoughtful about putting, right? Keeping, keeping, keep, keeping a reasonable range so that we don't have districts by virtue of preference falling off the bottom, right? And districts lifting off the top. And that is, that is a unique homegrown Vermont feature, right? Like other states don't have that kind of problem because they don't have, the, right? The, because they have a foundation formula and we don't have statewide property tax. 
And, you know, spending decisions, right, aren't calibrated entirely on local control. So, you know, to Representative Beck's point, yeah, these things are all big issues and they, and they need to be, right, I, you know, this many years into our system, there, there certainly is room to talk about, you know, what, what, what's good, what's bad, what's ugly in our system. The question is, is in the meantime, we have a system and this other conversation could take some time. And the question is, is what do we do in the meantime, right? Like, do, because the weights are miscalibrated and because of it, we're seeing both unintended and intended effects, right? And we're, we're seeing perversions that we probably would prefer not to have. I don't know, Representative Brady, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I mean, none of these are really answerable, but I, I think so. I'm, you know, obviously trying to see some things through the lens of my own, my own district and, um, and trying to understand how our per pupil spending, I believe is slightly below the state average. Um, and yet we would lose a tremendous amount of equalized pupils. Um, and perhaps I don't understand the school budget well enough, but I would imagine most, you know, I should know better because I'm on the school board, but it's still hard to know even as a board member. Um, you know, much of that is teaching. As teachers, we're, you know, from years of going through the budget, I know we're only within a couple students at most grade levels of EQS. Like we wouldn't be able to reduce teachers a whole lot and, and before we would start to be out of compliance with EQS and, and teacher class size. So I'm starting, I'm, I'm struggling to see maybe there's some other spending in our district I'm not aware of that's the pro I'm trying to figure out then how that all, <laughs> does a district even have a choice but to spend a lot more? Um, because otherwise would we be out of compliance with EQS when it comes to class size? But and I- it also, yeah. the, the yield also comes into that calculation too. Yeah. Right? Right, and that's why I said like the all of those things that I put on that list are explicit considerations that need to go along with this, right? I'm going to keep us open. I'm going to keep us open until twelve thirty, and then we'll we'll break. But this hey. is clearly important. So, Representative Hooper, I'm going to go back to you. I appreciate that. Now, I guess considering the clock, we I better hone in on the specifics of S13 and my curiosities about your reactions to certain aspects of the bill uh, before us. So just going back to your response to Representative Conlin, you said eight months probably is not enough time. And further, perhaps we need a, even a second committee to sort of oversee the work of the first one in the, in the immediate and then have, is that, do I understand? Let me clarify my comment. What I'm saying is that if the task is to redesign the entire school funding system in Vermont, then no, eight months is not the time, <laughs> right? Like there are bigger questions. If the task is to in, develop, if the task is to figure out how to effectively implement the findings in the waiting study, then eight months is enough time. But what, you, what I see in S13 right now is a hodgepodge of both, right? And my concern would be that we will be a mile wide and an inch deep and that at the end of the task force, the legislature will not have the information it needs to make either decision, right? Right. And I, I mean, I say that, I say that not because I have a preference on which way sure. you decide as policymakers. I'm just being attentive to the fact that we will all be back here in February having a conversation. And I know how thoughtful all of you and others in the legislature are trying to be around this and their need for information and clarification around this. And I think that you will feel very frustrated by the fact that you do not have the information you need to make concrete decisions come out of this task force if the scope is too broad and you don't get the depth that you need. If, if, the, poly, if, if the question on the table is what to do about the weights. Sure. So does that make sense? It does make sense. The, the, you're saying that the bill has a lot of provisions that are more on the studying side of things, which you have said is largely completed. I mean, you've got national notoriety for the, for the report that you produced and Basically, at this point, we just have to figure out how to implement the data that you provided for us, unless we sort of agree with Representative Beck that we kind of have to boil this stuff down and uh, 
if you're saw- looking for a wholesale change, then then if that's the policy decision that you want, if that if that's a direction you as legislators want to go, then this needs to be a much bigger group that has more time to work on that. If the policy decision, if what you are seeking from the task force is concrete, actionable information that will help you in deliberations around the question of whether to whether and how to make changes to the equalized pupil calculation, then the task, I would suggest, respectfully suggest that the task force scope needs to be more narrow and focused. And I do think that can be done in the eight month timeline. I see. And finally, Professor, um, perhaps it would be unfair for me to ask you to, to respond to the statements that uh, our honorable guest Scott Beck, Representative Beck had made, but you know, I'm curious to know, uh, indeed, would we have to just start over if what he said is true? So I have tons of respect for Representative Beck, and I think he has been incredibly thoughtful around issues of school funding, both when he was on the House Committee on Education, but also on Ways and Means, and I, he's also an educator. So I, you know, what I would say is, is that Representative Beck's points are well taken around the, the existing system, right? Like there is a fundamental disconnect between spending, right? And, uh, and revenue generation by, by design in our formula. And there's long been discussion and suspicion that that disconnect has um, been a driver of costs in this state. That is not, that's a good question. And we should be talking about that, right? That's a different set of questions and a different focus than what we had in the waiting study. And, you know, respectfully, what I would say is these are things we should be deliberating, right? The, the issues that, that Representative Back brings up are valid and important and should be considerations. But how we go about deliberating those, I don't think that that can happen in eight months. And I don't think that that can happen with a, a task force that is this narrowly sort of constructed and focused. Thank you. I'm sorry, that was my penultimate question. The ultimate one is, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are the consequences of failing to act on, on updating the, uh, the weights? Well, I think, uh, you know, back to what I was saying in my response to Representative Brady, right? Like, you know, the consequences are this, right? The weights are miscalibrated. If the weights are miscalibrated, then our, then that mechanism, which is our primary equity mechanism in the existing formula, is not working properly. Full stop, right? It's not working properly, right? The, 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 weight, the weights are the primary mechanism for equalizing costs across districts. And in that equalization comes incentives and disincentives around spending, which are intended, intended to result in adequate levels of spending across all districts in the state and equalizing educational opportunities. So to the extent that this weight, weights are miscalibrated, this, all of these things that are intended effects, you know, they're, they're, they're happening it's sort of a hodgepodge out there, right? Like it happens some places, they don't have it in some other places. And it's creating other kinds of stresses on our system with regard to revenue generation. So, you know, I, I feel like you might be going down that rabbit hole of, you know, do we have a constitutional problem? I'm, I'm not a legal scholar. And so I'm not gonna comment on that. But what I will say is that, this, that the, the, the formula as designed and as intended is not working that way right now because the weights are miscalibrated. That I can say, right? And the report is, is clear. Like, there's, frankly, there's not a lot of wiggle room on that, right? Like, the, legis- right? the weights are miscalibrated. And to the extent that the weights are miscalibrated, then the rest of the formula isn't going to be operating as intended. And so the consequences of that are you have a formula that's not operating as intended, which means it's not achieving all the other goals that are set forth for the formula. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I, I think you've, um, you've, you've helped the committee understand a little bit better um, your recommendations on moving forward. I think the committee will always be concerned, not just about the taxpayer equity and what it might do, but really getting to student equity mm-hmm. and what we know in, and what students need and what opportunity looks like is having high quality teachers high quality leadership 
and the time, um, which is what 173 tried to do. Mm -hmm. So while we're working on that, I do know that this committee has a, a tremendous interest in the other questions um, related. As I said repeatedly, they're not unimportant questions, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, remember that money, money is a means, not the end. Right, like we want to make sure that the fiscal, right, our fiscal house, our fiscal policies are enablers for all the other really important stuff that happens in schools, right? Like we, and so I think you're exactly right. The focus always needs to be on the kids, right? But we also have to make sure that our fiscal house is in order with respect to how we distribute resources and the adequacy of those resources, so that we can do this piece well over here. Do you see um, when Act 60 passed, I think districts just kind of got slammed um, with, the, with the changes. Um, because we have federal funds that are actually being distributed to districts with, uh, with poverty in mind, um, does give those districts a little bit more help than they would normally be used to. We have over 400 million yep. going directly to our school systems in addition to support from the Agency of Education. Do you see that this perhaps give us, give us a little bit more time to, to get this right as we're moving to transitioning? I guess what I would say this, you know, a year ago when, when you asked that question, you know, I think my level of concern around the transition was much greater. You know, the reality is with the federal dollars coming into the state right now, we have, we have a window, a policy window of opportunity to buffer some of these changes, right? To buffer school districts from some of these changes that we didn't have a year ago. And we know that we have that window open for about two years. That's it, right? Because those dollars, right? There are ways, right? There, I, I respectfully suggest that there are ways to creatively use these federal dollars coming into the state as, as, as an instrument that can ease a transition with the weights, right? And we didn't have that option a year ago, right? And so, you know, if there's interest in, in, in moving that direction, right? To actually making the change of policy priority to changing the weights, you know, there is a window here for the next two years to leverage federal resources to ease that transition in ways that we did not have, opportunities that we did not have a year ago. So I don't know if that answers your, your question, Representative Webb, but um, you know, I think, there's, I think there will be constituents that argue that there's urgency with changing the weights because of equity concerns. Um, so that might, that's one sort of timing issue. But also, you know, with these federal funds and the clock on those funds and, and the potential for using those funds as to, in the transition, that adds an, an added sort of time dimension to this discussion. And so that brings me back to the task force, right? You know, you've asked the task force to have a report to you in January, so you might act next year, right? Acting next year would keep you within that federal window, right? Of being able to use some of those dollars, pushing it out a year, maybe not, right? Maybe not. So, you know, there, there, are, there are arguments for urgency on both sides. I'm not, I'm being very careful, I'm not advocating. Like these are decisions you as policymakers need to make. I wanna thank you very much. Uh, for joining us today. Uh, we have a room full of some other people that we will probably be hearing from later, but it seemed best for us to just focus on using your time and having the committee have an opportunity to, to speak with you since you've been so intimately attached to this process. And thank um, you again for the invitation. And to all of you, um, I, feel free to reach out by email. I'm always happy to try to respond to specific questions um, about the report or any aspect of my testimony. Always happy to do that. And I'm always happy to come back again, Representative Webb, that there are opportunities for other clarifications. Yeah, we, we, may, we may be reaching out to you again. Um, okay. Much appreciated. Be well, everyone. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll be following up later on where we want to go with this. Um, I am going to encourage us to be focused on the uh, task force in our questions as we go forward, um, rather than us trying to be adjusting weights and working on that right now. I don't think we have the time and expertise to do that, uh, but I think we do have the time and expertise to figure out what a task force would do. Um, and I guess with that, 
uh, we I do not believe that we're meeting after floor. I, we expect this to be a long floor, as I remember. Um, what do we have? Do we have anybody coming in this afternoon? We do not this afternoon at this time. So just in terms of other, other planning, um, I'm hoping that we will be able to pull together the last pieces of S16 and S115 to allow us to bring that to committee for a vote on Tuesday for us to make sure if, if we are looking at a potential end date of the legislature by May 10th, we need to get our work over to the Senate to give them time and we need to get our work to other committees. So we're gonna have to sort of, at some point, you just have to say we've completed our work as uncomfortable as that is for our committee um, to, to move that on to either ways and means or appropriations. So- Sorry, um, you, will you yeah. repeat that? I was. I was still reading waiting things. Will you repeat what you just said about S16? <laughs> yes. I'm hoping that we can pull that together. Um, the, the, you know, a last last draft to get yep. that before the committee. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with time tomorrow. I'm hoping that we're yeah. going to be able to meet. <laughs> We've got a long floor. Um, I'm hoping that we can get that ready. I, I'm inclined to um, vote our bills out on Tuesday. Great. So give, give folks folks a chance. So um, that's kind of where we are at this point in terms of what the remaining questions. I know that Representative Brady, you were working on, on that. We're waiting to hear from the agency on some of the work they're doing in relation to, S, to S, uh, 16 in terms of- I have those, we have those now. So I'll, and Jim has them, so I'll connect with him. And so, so we should have, the updated draft Tuesday. I'm sure people will continue to lob changes, but <laughs> yeah, if, if if it's possible to get any of those to us uh, before the weekend, that would be great. Um, okay. And uh, it's it's my intention that we're going to be able to vote for it, even if it's not perfect, <laughs> um, because it is going to money committees. In addition, we're looking at the current bill that we've talked about today. Um, I would like to make sure that this bill has an opportunity to get to Ways and Means uh, because it does affect um, the Ed Fund, or maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> um, but want, want them to have an opportunity to weigh in on this. So I'm hoping that we can move that to the other committee, um, perhaps by the end of next week. Uh, Representative Beck, do you have anything that you wanted to add at this point? You appreciate I don't. I, I don't. Um, thank you for including me in the conversation. And um, so I thought I heard you say you're trying to move it out Tuesday. So you said no. I think 13 will probably try to move out um, Friday. Oh, okay. And okay. So you got some time with it. Yeah. We we okay. just we've got these other bills that we have to have to work and work with, and and then we have to present all these bills on the floor. So. <laughs> So um, my, my intention would be that we would finish that up at the end of the week and get it to you. Um, but okay. we would appreciate having you join us as we're yeah. working on that. Um, we're, we're after um, S53 today, we're a little, little quiet in House Ways and Means. So hopefully I'll be able to join you as much as possible. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so I will be presenting S114 to appropriations shortly and hoping that we can get that to the floor tomorrow or Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday is another option. And with that, I think- Kathleen that, has her hand up. Oh, Kathleen, excuse me. Yes. Thanks. Um, I, I know everybody's going to- kill me for talking about potentially adding someone to a task force. Um, but I, Chair Webb, I don't know how you want me to approach this, but I had a pretty compelling email exchange last night about um, some testimony we'd heard last week about adding a master's level social worker to the Wellness mm -hmm. Council. Would you, who, who would should you I talk be, to about that? Okay. Would you be willing to reach out to Ted Fisher? Because I know that he was um, looking at that, I believe, and, and just, just, um, because this this task force, I mean this this group, um, the wellness. I, I don't think that's been active. I think that was my understanding. Representative Coopley, you were there when Ted was speaking. That that's been kind of a dormant at this point. 
Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Reach. Uh, yeah, I would reach out to Ted on that Wait, issue. For his thought on that. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, in addition, uh, we definitely heard from the superintendents <laughs> about striking them <laughs> from the work group. They were not happy with being struck from the work group related to, I think it was S16, wasn't it? Yes. yes. Um, and they reminded me that, you know, because they're kind of the CEO of the whole thing, that they should be involved. So my recommendation is that we're going to put that back in. Okay. We're going to add one back in. Okay. With everybody. Okay. Great. And other than that, I think those bills are getting ready to go. And if, if it's possible to get S16, um, I'm still following up on your question about uh, libraries. I'm not sure if I've heard back yet. Um, Representative Austin. On that. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.